My name is Rachel Roberts. I'm a teacher, teacher trainer um, and materials writer. Um, I'm also a qualified life coach working with teachers and other educational professionals. So this kind of career skills, life skills is very much in the crossover between the two things that I do. And I've been doing, as you may be aware, a series of webinars on different career skills. Um, last week, for example, we did decision making and I'll show you at the end where you can go and catch up on any of these webinars that you may have missed. Um, I'm also one of the authors of the new Pearson Upper Secondary series, um, High Note. Um, and I'll be using some examples from that um, throughout the presentation. So before we start, just a little bit of housekeeping. Um, so the webinar is recorded and you will be sent a link to the recording um, and your certificate of attendance uh, within two weeks of the event. It's likely to be sooner than that, but it will definitely happen within two weeks. So just to let you know, um, right, so to start with then, I've got a little question um, for you. So we're talking in this webinar about um, helping our students to develop leadership skills, but I've got a question for you, which is, um, do you consider yourself to be a leader? Um, and you can, if you like, you can also say why yes or no. Right? So we've got some yeses and nos. Definitely not. No, yes, yes. <laughs> I think that might have been a laugh. I am, I think, no. So it's quite mixed, isn't it, in some situations, okay? Uh, yes, because I'm a teacher, All right? It depends on the situation. I don't, I work in a team. In a way, being a teacher and parent, it depends. Okay, so remember what you answered, because we'll come back to this. Right? So I have another little task for you. All right, so here's some vocabulary. And my question for you is, what do all of these words have in common? So what do all these words have in common? And I think they have more than one thing in common. Uh, politics, says Joseph or Yosef. Leader, bosses, rulers, power, important people, a kind of leader, hierarchy. OK, so I will tell you that all of these words um, were listed in a synonyms dictionary as being a synonym for leader. But they have something else in common don't know these words, as well as being synonym for leader. What else do they have in common? How else are they all similar? I think some people, okay, nouns, yes, I'll spot the teacher. Yeah, power, okay, that's authority, yes, Ursula, that's the kind of thing I was looking for. They all begin with consonants, true, yes, this is the kind of thing teachers say, isn't it? Yes, so, um, Alejandro says, a leader leads, doesn't command. All right? So this is a very specific type of leadership, isn't it? You know, commander, controller, master, mistress, you know, ruler, top dog, tsar. All right. It's very controlling. But this is often how um, people see being a leader. Right. So when people think about adjectives to describe leaders, these are the kinds of words that they often come up with. So, you know, somebody extrovert, somebody, you know, who loves getting up on, on a stage and inspiring others, somebody charismatic. All right. But as Alejandra says, you know, a leader should not command, a leader should guide. There are different kinds of leaders. Uh, let's take this woman, for example. Do you know who she is? Pop it in the chat box if you do. It's definitely not Gant, you know. It, yes, it's Rosa Parks. OK, we've got a few people putting Rosa Parks and that is right. OK, so do you know what Rosa Parks did? Do you know what she's famous for? She's definitely a leader. All right, on the bus, yes. Yeah, it's a bit long to put in the chat box, really, isn't it? So um, she is famous because back in the days when America segregated whites and blacks, so at the time of civil rights, 
um, in the 60s, she was on a bus and the bus at that time was divided into seats for white passengers and seats for black passengers. Um, and the driver um, attempted to get all the black passengers who were sitting down um, to move back in the bus and stand up so that white passengers could sit down. And Rosa Parks um, refused to move. And this set off um, a whole sort of chain of events and, and the, there were some whole sort of bus strikes. So this became a key part of the civil rights movement. So very definitely, you know, she was a leader. Um, but when she died um, relatively recently in 2005 at the age of 92, um, the obituaries remembered her as, as it says here, soft-spoken, sweet, small, timid and shy. Right? So timid and shy, but had the courage of a lion. Right? She had radical humility, quiet fortitude. So this quote comes from um, Susan Cain's book, uh, Quiet, the Power of Introverts in a World that Can't Stop Talking, which is a very interesting book because she's talking about all the positive qualities that introverts can have and you know introverts can be just as good leaders as extroverts they just do it in a, a different kind of way and sometimes a better way right, depending on the circumstances so you know we could add maybe to our list of adjectives to describe leaders we could add some to describe somebody like Rosa Parks so humble right, resilient right you know she just kept doing what she thought was right, although it was not easy. Passionate, right? she was passionate about the cause. So what other adjectives do you think we could add uh, to describe a good leader? Right, give me a few more examples. Her marriage says, I'm not a leader, I'm a truthful person, I never lie. Well, I think a good leader should never lie or only very rarely. Um, Yet determined and brave, listener and doer, motivated, courageous, imaginative, confident, fair, good listener, guiding, honest, outgoing, yes, sometimes goal oriented, motivated, hard working, compassionate. Um, they're going very, very fast, so I can't read all of them, but there's some great examples there. Um, here is some that I thought of myself, um, but we could add some of the ones that you've said as well, definitely. Um, so the ones I've added in here, empathic, um, you know, able to empathize with others. Um, you can also say empathetic, by the way, both are possible. Uh, creative, they've got to be able to come up with good ideas, I think. Honest, I think they should be honest. Uh, not all leaders are honest, as we see quite often, but they should be, I think. Self-aware, uh, willing to look at themselves and their strengths and weaknesses. Responsible strategic, able to plan, flexible, and, you know, the other things that you've mentioned as well. So this is a different kind of picture of a leader than the first idea that we looked at. And sometimes I think, you know, people don't necessarily see themselves as a leader because they are thinking of a leader as being the sort of extrovert, um, bossy, um, inspiring, you know, commanding kind of person. And actually, that's just one way of being a leader. But if, you know, if we as teachers are not necessarily comfortable about seeing ourselves as leaders, then how much more will our students not necessarily be comfortable to see themselves as leaders. You know, I think if you were to ask the students, probably only quite a small percentage would say that they were. Right? And yet, you know, we need leaders. And this is about career skills and, you know, thinking in terms of careers. The world and the world of work is certainly changing. And traditionally, we have this idea of the career ladder you know, that you climb up step by step this ladder. So you get promoted to the next stage and then you become, you know, somebody's team leader. Then you become a boss. Then you become the boss's boss. Then you perhaps become the CEO. So, you know, this sort of very linear hierarchical idea. 
but increasingly work is not really like that anymore and so now people are starting to talk not about the career ladder but the career lattice because there's a lot more sideways movement and there's a lot more sort of working in teams and you know when you work in teams and those teams change depending on what project you're working on then lots of different people will have leadership roles it isn't just about one person you know controlling everybody else it's much less top down so you know employers are looking for people who have these leadership skills they're not necessarily the kind of controlling bossy kind of leadership skills that we might initially um, have thought of uh, yeah don't worry about being late it, it happens and you can watch the recording and catch up um, anyway at the end okay so um, leadership skills are also so they're, they're important for work and they're something that employers are looking for and of course they, they can also be important in studies um, you know if students for example have to mentor other students um, then that's leadership skills if they are working in a group um, and you know helping that group to do a, a project together that can be leadership skills so these are skills that are very much things that our students need now um, in their studies in their future studies perhaps even more so as they become more independent in studying and definitely um, they are skills that employers are looking for. So the big question then, how can we help students um, to develop their leadership skills? Um, so maybe the first thing I think is to recalibrate their view of what a leader is. Um, role play, okay, we'll, we'll get to that, yes. So, you know, first of all, I do think we need to help students to see themselves as leaders. Um, and we can do that really in a very similar way to the way that we did at the beginning of this webinar. Right? You could do exactly the same thing with your students. You could look at some words to describe leaders at some adjectives and help them to broaden their view of what a leader is. Um, you can also, I think, um, help them to look at examples of leaders and, and evaluate kind of what makes a good leader. So this is um, a lesson from High Note. This is from level four. And it's a lesson, it's a vocabulary lesson about personal qualities and behavior. Um, but the topic of the lesson is role models. And so the students think about some well-known people and consider, you know, if they could be suitable role models or not. You know, it's it's for them to evaluate and decide. And then um, towards the end of the lesson, if you see with the speaking, that they are asked to think about, you know, the responsibility of famous people to be good role models. Who are their role models? You know, public figures, friends, family. In fact, we know for teenagers that their peers are usually their most important role models. And they're asked to consider who they could be a role model for um, and why. So this is kind of getting them to start thinking about themselves in that leadership role. So we could take this a little bit further. And this is a, an activity um, which is often done in business coaching, uh, leadership coaching. And it's um, often referred to as leadership pizza. Right? I'm sure you can see why. All right, so it's like a pizza. We've got eight slices of the pizza. And I have actually labeled each slice of the pizza myself with some of the leadership qualities that I think um, are important. And these are some of the ones that we talked about a few minutes ago when we were sort of brainstorming qualities of good leaders. So you could do the same thing. You could choose your eight qualities. Or alternatively, um, students could decide themselves, maybe individually or in pairs, how they're going to label these eight parts of the pizza, or you could do it as a kind of um, pyramid discussion. So a pyramid discussion is when one student, each individual student decides on eight 
um, qualities that they think are most important, then they get together with another student and the two of them have to decide on eight together. Then they get together with another pair of students and the four of them have to decide on eight together. And then you can take it up to eight students all deciding together. So that's a pyramid discussion. So whichever way you do it, um, you have the pizza with the qualities and then you ask the students to evaluate themselves. So here's an example of um, a completed leadership pizza, um, just randomly completed in, in this case. So the students colour in the amount of the pizza. So if they feel that they have this quality very strongly, then they would colour it in almost completely. Uh, if they feel it's something that they still need to develop, uh, they would perhaps just colour in a little bit of it. So this is a kind of a way of evaluating uh, those skills they have and those skills that they have yet to develop. And notice that I say yet to develop. This is not about um, a deficit. This is not about, oh, I don't have this skill and I never will. This is the kind of growth mindset approach of, OK, you can see the areas where you need to develop more. Now, how are you going to do that? How are you going to become stronger in those areas? And that's what we're going to, to look at right, in the rest of the webinar. So, um, so how can they become stronger in those areas? Right. Um, some of you I saw already were mentioning like group work and project work. And I think this is absolutely right. I think one of the things that we need to be doing is giving students opportunities um, to practice and develop leadership skills. And the best way, I think, to give them those opportunities is to put them into groups um, and to let them practice. However, what often happens when you put students into groups is that the same people take over. Those people who already feel that they are good leaders lead and everybody else follows. So we probably need to think a little bit more about how we can um, make sure that everybody has an opportunity to practice those skills. So. Um, this is a kind of classroom management um, matter, if you like. So here are some of the things that we can do. So, you know, we can nominate group leaders. So rather than just letting it happen naturally, actually suggest people. And if we do this, we can select as well based on the task that they're doing. We can choose something that we think somebody will be able to lead effectively or that they need practice in leading. Um, we can have a random selection of group leaders. You know, they could pull a slip of paper or what some teachers do is they have like a little um, wooden lolly stick with every student's name on a different one and they just pull them out randomly. We could rotate the leadership role so that every student gets a chance over a certain number of lessons. Or we could let the groups themselves uh, select a leader. But of course, in this case, we need to make sure they don't always select the same one, but we can make it clear that they need to change it around. But it's about consciously thinking about this and not just kind of letting it happen. Um, so that's one thing we can do. And we can also, I think, uh, step back a little bit more ourselves. Um, you know, as teachers, of course, you know, it is our job uh, to manage um, the classroom to a large degree. But I wonder whether when some of you at the beginning were saying you definitely weren't a leader, whether perhaps that was because you were feeling that you were more of a facilitator um, and that you, you know, you want the students to do things for themselves. Right? Yes, people are saying, right, exactly. And I think that is right. But that is also, I think, a form of leadership. Um, it's just a different kind of leadership. And definitely, I think it is important that we are able to step back and give our students responsibility. Um, this is part of the process of them growing up. Um, they have to learn how to learn and they have to be able to learn independently. And we can't you know, do it all for them. And certainly when they go to university or college or they go into jobs, you know, they are going to be expected 
to be more independent. Yes, responsibility is absolutely necessary. So a teacherless task is quite a nice way of both encouraging this independence and also um, highlighting the need for it, if you like. So um, a teacherless task is something um, that was in, I don't know if it was invented, but that was first made popular um, by Mario Rinvalucri. Uh, I don't know if you've heard of him, but he wrote a lot of books that have been in the late 70s and early 80s. And the idea of a teacherless task is that the students have to work together um, to solve some kind of puzzle um, and the teacher does not intervene. So they have to sort it out themselves. Um, and this creates um, a great deal of language, actually, because, of course, they have to do it in English. Um, but it also highlights um, kind of the group dynamics um, because everybody has to participate in a teacherless task. That's part of the design. So I'll show you what I mean. Um, so here is an example of a teacherless task. So this is based on a um, logical sort of thinking task. Uh, yes, wonderful, Mario. Um, so this is based on a sort of logical, uh, there is a word for this kind of task and it's gone out of my head. But OK, so we've got nine points here and each student um, gets given a piece of paper with one of these points on only. So no one student has all this information. They only have one part of the information each. And what they have to do is to work together in groups of nine in this case, um, to put the information together and solve the puzzle. So this requires them to work together quite effectively and closely. Um, yes, so some people have already worked it out. Well done. Right. So they have to, first of all, put together all the information and then they have to solve the puzzle. And yes, lots of people have, um, I don't know if you already knew it, maybe, but the answer to this puzzle is he walks up the stairs because he can only get to the seventh floor because that's the height of the tallest, the highest button that he can reach. He can't reach the button for the 10th floor. Right. So it's just an example, but you can use these kinds of logic puzzles in this way. So each student has one part of the puzzle. In fact, there are some things here which are totally irrelevant, like he plays a lot of football isn't, isn't relevant. Right. Um, OK, so you can do it with a logic puzzle. You can also do it with a story. So you can give students, you know, a, a divided up story and they have to work together to put the story in order. So anything where they each have one part of the puzzle and they have to work together is a teacherless task. And it's it's very good obviously for producing language because there'll be lots of negotiation of meaning, um, clarification and so on. And you can listen to what they're saying. Yeah, teacherless task doesn't mean you go and have a coffee, you are listening. And you can note down, um, you know, any mistakes that they make, any particularly good examples of language. So it's very rich in terms of language. But you can also get them to afterwards discuss how they solve the problem and what kind of roles people took within that, you know, who took control and was a leader, you know, who perhaps didn't contribute enough. So there's, yes, there is indeed a lot that can be done with the material. And I think the, this works very well for students. So to summarize then, you know, one way we can help students to develop leadership skills is of course, to give them opportunities to lead. Right. But what else can we do? I think we can also explicitly teach leadership skills. So going back to the leadership pizza that we saw earlier, we had, you know, like eight um, leadership skills there or qualities. Let's look at um, how we can develop um, some of those. So first of all, um, motivation and inspiration. So this is a quality that um, we probably all agree that leaders have. So how can we help them to develop the ability to motivate and inspire? 
Um, now, you know, some people might feel that this is a question of personality. I think uh, to a degree, yes, some people do do this more naturally, but I also believe that it is something which all of us um, can actually develop. It's often a matter of confidence as much as anything. So one thing that we can do, I think, is to give them examples of um, more ordinary people, if you like, who do inspiring things. So not just, you know, people who climb Mount Everest um, or people who rescue people from burning buildings, but more ordinary people. So this is an example. This is a reading text from High Note Level 4. And um, this is about, uh, this is a real story about this guy, Sean O'Brien, um, who was um, like a meme was could have created of him dancing. And because he was overweight, lots of people started bullying him and laughing at him. And this particular, uh, this group of women um, who were shown in the picture in America um, decided to do something about this. Um, and so they set up an event um, in America and raised money um, for him to take an all expenses paid trip to Los Angeles to meet and dance with them as part of their sort of body positive movement. So this story really is about kind of um, when you see something bad happening to somebody, what do you do? You know, how do you step up and step in? And this is what these women did. And the final question here, the discussion question, you know, is about those situations where it's perhaps difficult to do the right thing, but you manage to do it. Um, so what factors helped you to do this? Oh, you've had this article in a different course book. Oh, well, there you go. Pe teachers, writers often do come up with similar ideas, but I, I wrote this lesson um, and it was definitely um, not copied from anywhere else at the time. But we're often other writers are often looking at the same sources and thinking that's a good story. But it is a good story, I think. So we can show examples like this and we can also help students to um, consider, you know, what skills and abilities they already have. Um, so we looked at this a bit with the leadership pizza. This is another um, activity that comes from um, business coaching. And this is um, called Leadership Coat of Arms. Uh, and this is a, a really fun activity to do, I think, with students. So a coat of arms, as you probably know, is usually divided into sections and each section has a meaning. And you can look this up online um, because there are specific meanings for the different colours, um, specific meanings for the animals. And then most coats of arms, this one doesn't have it, but most of them have a motto which is like a little sort of saying um, that the family believes in. So, for example, a very famous one, um, it's in Latin, but in English is through adversity to the stars. You know, so it often has this kind of motivational, inspirational um, aspect to it. So you can find these lists of what the colours and the animals mean, and the students can choose ones that they feel encapsulate qualities that they have. So, and then of course they can tell their partners about their coat of arms and explain why it's important to them. So it's a great speaking activity, but it also helps students to build up that self-confidence that they actually have, um, you know, qualities that enable them to be a good leader. Um, yeah, it works very nicely in class, this one. And of course we can also, you know, actually literally teach them how to motivate and inspire. So this is a life skills lesson, um, again from level four, and it's about how to give a persuasive presentation. So those kinds of, you know, like TED Talks, where which are very inspiring and motivational. And um, in this lesson, you know, the students um, learn about, I mean, they, they watch an example of this kind of talk, and they learn about what are the ingredients in this kind of talk. You know, so, you know, having a strong uh, beginning and ending, for example, you know, how to engage the audience. So we are literally teaching them how to be more motivating and inspiring. OK, moving on to um, another aspect that was on my pizza, um, empathy and understanding. All right, so understanding of others. 
Now, you know, I think that empathy is absolutely vital in being a good leader, because if you're working with others, you need to understand that not everybody is the same as you and that people work differently, that people have different strengths. Um, you need to, it's so empathising here, I don't mean it like sympathising, like, you know, being nice to people necessarily, but about understanding that people can see things differently. So how can we do that? Well, again, we can um, use this as a topic when we're teaching. So this is from High Note Level 3, and it's a grammar lesson, um, but there is a focus, the focus of the topic is empathy. So there's kind of like a dual purpose to this lesson. It's partly teaching uh, life skills, uh, we're also teaching grammar. So the students can take this quiz and learn a little bit more about themselves and about what makes somebody more um, empathic or empathetic or not. Um, here's another example. Uh, this comes from high school, high note, uh, level four. And this is a lesson about emotional intelligence. Um, so in this lesson, you know, students learn about what emotional intelligence is. And then if you look at exercises eight and nine, so they're again, self-analyzing, you know, what do you think you're strongest at? And um, they've looked at what the different aspects of emotional intelligence are, as you can see in exercise five. And how could you further improve your emotional intelligence? So again, we're looking at, you know, where are you now? What are your strengths and how can you further improve? And then in exercise nine, they're applying those skills. So they're thinking about situations and how they could um, help somebody in that situation. And that is leadership. You know, that is being able to step in and help in a difficult situation rather than just kind of, you know, trying to pretend it's not happening. Right. Um, what book is it? It's High Note, um, which is Pearson's new upper secondary series. Okay, so I was saying that empathy, I think, is about um, being able to understand different perspectives. And this is uh, an example of a lesson, again, from level four. Uh, and this is about um, a virtual reality um, film experience that was created. Uh, this is actually something real that was that it is on YouTube for people to experience what it's like or what it might be like to be on the autistic spectrum. Obviously, this is different for everybody, but it's looking at the aspect of um, being hypersensitive to sounds and smells and sensory things. And so there's a description of what it might feel like to be in that situation. And then the students think about um, the ability of VR to help us walk in someone else's shoes and to um, develop more empathy in that way. OK, so another thing we had on the leadership pizza, um, responsibility and initiative. Now, I know several of you were saying, you know, students have to become more responsible. And I totally agree. And this is part of, you know, becoming an adult. Um, as children, you know, we don't have much responsibility. And then through the teenage years, we hopefully take on more. So some of the ways we can help students with that. Um, you know, we can help them to see opportunities outside the classroom to take on more responsibility and initiative. So, for example, volunteering is something that they can do. Um, we can also, um, here's another example. This is um, a writing lesson, but embedded into this is this idea of, you know, what changes could you and your family make at home? Um, to make your lifestyles more sustainable or to reduce the impact on the environment. Um, and this is a, a little activity which um, I've used um, to very good effect in class. Uh, and this is sort of helps them to build confidence in themselves, which is part of this taking on responsibility. It's actually having the confidence to know that you can do it. So this activity is called um, My Hidden Strength. 
And what you do is you just give out a little piece of paper um, and they have to write down something that they are good at that they think nobody else in the class will know about. Because often students have these hidden strengths that people don't know about. And so this is um, a way for them to share with the class some of these hidden strengths, which will help to build their confidence. And it's also a good bonding exercise within a class because they learn more about each other. So they write down their hidden strength. You take in the bits of paper. They don't have their name on them. And then um, the idea is to kind of guess and find out who has which hidden strength. So there are lots of different ways that you can do it. Um, you could put them up on the wall and people have to go around and uh, write down who they think each one is. Or you could give um, a handful of them to a group and they have to think who it is. Um, or you could even do it as a, as a whole class. Um, but yes, you know, we have to help students find their hidden strength is in the comments. Absolutely. But if students really think about it, there's, there's nearly always something, you know, whether it's, um, I don't know, you know, they're the person who always sorts out fights between their siblings, for example, or, you know, maybe they play the clarinet and people don't know about it. So it's about sort of building, building that confidence up. Okay, so next, giving and receiving appropriate feedback. Now, I happen to think that this one is a very important uh, leadership skill um, because if you, if you can't, well, you need, as a leader, you have to be able to give feedback. Um, so you have to be able to um, tell the people that you're working with uh, what they're doing well, but also where they need to improve. Um, and you also have to be able to receive feedback um, because I think as a leader, I talked about people being self-aware, right? you have to be able to look at your own um, weaknesses as well as your strengths. Otherwise, you are not going to be able to help other people to develop theirs. And, you know, this is quite difficult and sensitive, I think. And I think as teachers, we often want to kind of protect students uh, from any kind of criticism. However, this is something that they need to learn to be able to do, is to take constructive criticism and to be able to give constructive criticism. Um, yes, yeah, so you're saying my university students give their feedback at the end of each lesson to you, presumably. I mean, I, yes, I mean, I think, you know, I think that's good because you have to, it is a very important career skill. Um, you have to be able to give and take um, crit criticism, constructive criticism or feedback. Yes, the recording will be available later in answer to that question. So, you know, this is sensitive, but I think we have to do it and we have to give students opportunities to learn how to do it. So here is an example. This comes from High Note Level 2. So this is quite early in the course um, and students are asked to give each other feedback you know throughout the course but here's where we first kind of teach it and this is part of a life skills lesson on how to give a presentation and students if you look at the last column students are kind of first of all guided to give feedback on the video presentation that they watch so on the ideas and organization and on the on the presenter themselves um, and then at the end of the lesson, they prepare a two minute presentation and they give each other feedback um, on that presentation. So now this is not in the work, but this is after every two lessons, there is a life skills lesson. And this is one of those. And in fact, presentation skills are covered in levels um, two, three and four because they're quite important uh, skills, I think, for students. Okay, yeah, so I mean, as you say, Agnes, you know, students often receive feedback criticism not too well. I think that's right, and that's, but that's why we have to do it and not avoid it, because they have to learn to be able to do that. Employers want people who can both give feedback and receive it constructively. And perhaps related to this, um, the idea of, you know, resilience, uh, sometimes you will get criticism and not like it. Sometimes your idea will fail. Um, and I think, you know, resilience is about learning 
um, how you deal with those kinds of failures or disappointments or problems um, and how you can learn from them and indeed, you know, even grow further from them. So, you know, how can we do that with students? Well, I think the first thing is to really understand what resilience is. Right? Uh, be able to say, are teachers fans of criticism? I don't know. Nobody's a fan of criticism. Um, but I think you can learn to take it better. You know, I mean, as a writer, I receive criticism all the time because every time I hand anything into my editors, it comes back with loads of notes on it, you know, and it's just part of the process. So I think if we can teach people um, to deal better with criticism, we are setting them up much better for the workplace. And the same with resilience, you know, so as it says here, you know, being resilient isn't about being tough and never worried about anything. It's about dealing with well with difficulties when they arise so I think helping them to understand that is key and in this lesson and this is a life skills lesson again you know we look at sort of some of the key strategies if you like for building resilience so about looking after yourself about being willing to ask for help um, you know seeing setbacks and disappointments as an opportunity to learn as well as you know obviously not being a great experience so we can we can do that and we can also kind of show them examples. So this is um, a listening and vocabulary lesson um, from level four. And the topic is about sort of life events that are quite sort of stressful and challenging. And these are the kinds of things that are very normal for teenagers. So, you know, like the birth of a new baby in the family, for example, suddenly, you know, you don't have the attention, the baby's crying all the time, or maybe failing an exam, uh, for example, or moving house and having to kind of make new friends and, you know, moving to a different city. So, you know, these kinds of things have to be handled sensitively. So you will notice that, you know, we don't have um, as part of this lesson, a section where we're saying to the students, so tell us about something difficult that happened in your life, because that might be too sensitive. However, we are giving them a, a, the opportunity by looking at situations that might be similar to what they might have gone through um, to be able to, at least internally, make the connection with their own lives. And of course, if they want to talk about it, that's fine as well, but we're not making them do it because we have to be sensitive about this kind of thing. Okay, so um, going back to the leadership pizza, all right? Think flexibly and creatively, all right? So creativity um, often comes up as one of the key skills that employers are looking for. And, you know, thinking flexibly is part of that. It's about, you know, being able to look at things from a different angle. So um, a classic activity that you can also use in class is this one. This is often used like at job interviews and things. And the question is to think of some other things that you could do with a paper clip apart from clipping paper together. All right. So do you have any ideas? What else could you do with a paper clip apart from using it for its intended purpose? to hang something says Lydia yeah yeah uh, maybe if you lose a button you could use it to keep your cardigan together open the door yes pick a lock open a zip all right yeah bracelet make a flower all right get my card from the phone yeah your sim card absolutely hairpin decorations on a Christmas tree oh okay yeah to sort of pin back your fringe yeah Okay, brilliant. Loads of ideas. So this this is um, often used as kind of like a test of creativity. Like how many ideas can you come up with? Because it's about thinking flexibly. And so I think, you know, one of the things that we can do is to um, help our students understand that being creative is not necessarily the same thing as being, say, artistic. Um, you know, students very often, all of us very, um, have this tendency to kind of decide that, you know, we're not very good at certain things. So you will hear students say things like, oh, I'm not very creative, you know, I'm more, I'm more scientific or um, better at maths or, but actually everybody is a bra 
Uh, I think maybe you mean to connect a bra rather than to be a bra. But anyway, we won't go into that. Uh, yes, everybody can be very creative um, if creativity is simply about allowing your mind to be open and flexible and looking at things from another angle exactly. Right. So this is again is a life skills lesson. This is from level three and it's about kind of like how to be more creative. So this looks at what being creative means um, and how to kind of develop that skill. Uh, schools kill creativity these days. Yes, well, let's try and, you know, bring some back in again, because I agree. And the final task here is a bit similar to what you've done, only with an umbrella. So they have to think about, you know, different ways of using it. Um, the book is called High Note. Right. OK, High Note. I'll, yeah, you'll be able to, to look that up afterwards as well, I think. OK, so we've looked at some some different ways to develop these leadership skills in students. So now I'd like you to think back to um, at the beginning of the webinar when I asked you whether you see yourself as a leader. So, you know, thinking about the different ways that we've looked at being a leader, um, you know, would any of you now kind of change your mind and say that perhaps, yes, you are a leader, half a leader? <laughs> <laughs> okay, Anya. Uh, yes, I have. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, being a facilitator is also a form of being a leader. And I do actually think that as teachers, we are leaders. Um, we are often role models, right? And we do have these kinds of skills, all right? So whether you agree with me or not, and that's fine if you don't, right? you know, these kinds of skills that, that we agreed were good leadership skills are all absolutely good skills for a teacher to have, aren't they? Um, and, you know, you could do the leadership pizza yourself if you felt inclined, you know, have a think about where, which of these slices do you feel that it's pretty full for you? And which of them do you still need to develop a bit? And, you know, you can work on those areas. Right? Okay, um, so, Thank you very much. I hope you found um, some inspiration there in um, teaching leadership skills. The next webinar that we're doing uh, is going to be on teamwork skills, which is kind of the other side of the coin. Uh, but notice that that's going to be on the 17th of March. So not next week, um, but the week after at the same time. Um, thank you very much for attending. Um, and um, I hope to see you at the Teamwork Skills webinar. If, does anybody have any questions? Um, um, we've got a few minutes if anybody's got any questions. To what extent do you think leadership depends on inborn traits and or hard work? I think some people are naturally more comfortable in a leadership role, but I very much believe that this is something that everybody um, can learn to do. And they might not do it in the same way, um, but that's absolutely fine because there are different kinds of leaders. So thank you all very much. Uh, this is great. I'm just looking to see if there are any more questions before I go. Um, how to handle refusal of leader um, decisions? Uh, well, I mean, I think that's a that's a big question, but often I think you know teenagers often want to rebel against um adults and that's actually quite normal um and sometimes what can work is to give i think students more responsibility rather than less because that kind of breaks away from that sort of fight for power between you and the student but you know obviously um okay what well, i'm not sure i can really recommend other books by by pearson because you know i'm just working on this one uh, the, the course duration, uh, again, off the top of my head, I can't say, but if you have a look on the website, you can find out more information about High Note. Um, this website here, english.com slash careers dash skills, um, is um, where you can find all this other related material to career skills. So please do take a lot there. How bad is being a follower and not a leader? I don't think it's bad at all. I mean, being a good team member is also important. Uh, but sometimes I think every member of the team does need to step up and, and take some more of a leadership um, role.
through adversity to the stars is brilliant. Yes, I love that one. It's um, per ardua ad astra, I think, in Latin, which sounds really nice as well. All right, the book is High Note. Yes, no, it's not called Life Skills, it's called High Note. Um, brilliant, thank you very much. Who is my role model? Oh, I don't know, actually. Off the top of my head, I'd have to have a think about that one. Problem with people who are role models is they often then do something and let you down, don't they? Uh, it may be hard to motivate a student to develop these skills. Well, yes, but this is what we're here for, isn't it? All right. Um, okay, lovely. Thank you very much then. And, and I will see you again on uh, the 17th if you're signed up for that one. And if you've missed any of the earlier webinars and they are available on this site as well right. oh and i should just say as well that um, there is another webinar coming up on the 18th of march on leadership so this is not an elt specific uh, webinar this is but it is about uh, career skills so if you're interested in this then you might enjoy that too uh, the pizza concept will stay with me yes well it, it must be getting towards tea time as well in poland i'm guessing Okay, so is it going to be different? Well, it will be about leadership in general, uh, leadership skills in general, rather than e English language teaching. Okay, thanks very much then.